Welcome back to Face the Nation. Only two presidents have been impeached in the history of our country. Andrew Johnson in 1868 and Bill Clinton in 1998. Richard Nixon, of course, resigned in 1974 before the House could take a final vote. We're now joined by two reporters who broke the stories about Nixon and Clinton. Bob Woodward is an associate editor at The Washington Post who won a Pulitzer Prize for his Watergate coverage. Peter Baker is chief White House correspondent for The New York Times and helped break the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Good to have both of you here. Thank you. And we'll try to sort of give some perspective. We haven't been through this as a country many times before. Right. Um, Peter, you cover the current White House. I have not heard of war rooms or strategy sessions. Have you discovered what the Trump administration is going to do? Well, I think you have a war room of one right now, one man and an iPhone, basically, or whatever smartphone he's using. And there is no other structure around him that has been set up in a, in a, in a coherent way, unlike the Clinton uh, White House, which did, in fact, build a war room uh, to defend him in that impeachment. The president has yet to do that. Uh, he may get there. There's talk about that. There's a lot of struggling inside. Who would be in charge? Would it be the White House chief of staff? Would they have a separate unit? That kind of thing. But for the moment, the president feels like he's his own best defender. What do you think, for, as someone who, who's been observing President Trump's behavior, is he reacting as you'd expect? Well, uh, you, you need to try to step back and look at who he is. And he's somebody who hates to lose. Mm -hmm. He's got to win. I have a scene in my book, Fear, where they're talking about, uh, Trump is talking about the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un. And he said, and Trump says, this is about leader versus leader, man versus man, me versus Kim. In other words, it's personal combat. They're gladiators in the Coliseum to a certain extent. And so he's not somebody who's going to bend on this. Uh, what I think we need to worry about uh, is it's a war. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask the question, uh, how does this war end? In the case of the Clinton uh, imp impeachment, as uh, Peter so cr well chronicled in his book, after Clinton is acquitted in the Senate, it's a... It's a um, very stunning moment. He goes in the rose. Oh, oh, have you got it? Yeah, we actually have oh. that tape if we can play yeah. it. What I want the American people to know, what I want the Congress to know, is that I am profoundly sorry for all I have done wrong in words and deeds. I never should have misled the country, the Congress, my friends, or my family. Quite simply, I gave in to my shame. I have been condemned by my accusers with harsh words. That was not a victory lap. He apologized. He said, I, I am sorry for what I said and did that triggered this, and we've got to reconcile. We need to uh, go into a period of renewal. Knowing what we know about Trump, he's not going to apologize, I suspect, whether he wins or loses. Peter, the, the takeaway most people seem to have, the conventional wisdom, is that looking at what happened with Clinton, that it is a politically losing strategy mm. uh, to go through with an impeachment. Right. Is that model actually applicable here? I mean, no sitting president running for re-election. Right has faced impeachment before. I think that's a really important point you just made, Mark. Both Nixon and Clinton were in their second terms. They weren't going to face the voters again. We may find that the outcome in Congress is similar to the Clinton case, in which case you have uh, an impeachment vote by the House along party lines, the opposition party largely impeaching a president of the other party, and an acquittal or some sort of dismissal by a Senate that can't get to a two-thirds bipartisan vote. But in this case, you will have an appeal. You will have a greater appeals court, and that will be the court of public opinion, because in November of 2020, this issue will have been teed up for the voters to decide, is President Trump fit for office or not? Did the things we learned through the impeachment uh, tell us something about whether he deserves a second term, and what does it tell us about the Congress and how they handled it? it and it contrasts so sharply with what we mentioned in the introduction, is that Nixon didn't even want to go through the vote on impeachment. He didn't want the indignity of it. it, it it's an astonishing moment. Barry Goldwater, the 
Republican conservative went with the House and uh, Senate leaders, uh, Republican leaders, to see Nixon after the smoking gun tape was released. And Goldwater had Carl Bernstein and myself up to his apartment. And he got out the whiskey, and then he got out his personal diary. And he said that it was August 7th, a couple of days after that smoking gun tape was released, he and the Republican leaders went to meet with Nixon alone in the Oval Office. And they said, we're going to let Barry Goldwater be our spokesman. And so Nixon, how many votes am I going to have in the Senate? I know I'm going to be impeached. Stunning moment, Goldwater said, Mr. President, I have counted. And there are four very firm votes for you. I am not one of them. Hmm. And the next day, Nixon announced he was going to resign. He was withdrawing from the battlefield. And as you look back on it, uh, you know, 45 years ago, he has to get some credit for not letting the war go on. And yet, as you heard on this program from Senator Blunt, he wouldn't even discuss the conduct of the president, yeah. instead saying he didn't really mean what he said. Right. Yeah, he didn't want to defend him. None of them, almost very few of them anyway, want to defend the conduct. The few who are speaking out on his behalf are attacking the process. Right. Right. The other side is partisan. The other side is unfair. The other side are spies or whistleblowers. All that not talking about what the president did and whether that's okay. I did a survey, if you will, of former White House chiefs of staff going back to Reagan, Republican and Democrat, over the last couple of days. Not one of them could remember a circumstance where they solicited or accepted foreign help in, in the context of a contest with political uh, implications like this. This is something that hasn't been done. So Republicans don't want to defend it, but they do want to stick by the president for the moment because he controls the party in a way that Nixon didn't, mm. and even the way Clinton didn't, in 1998. What do you mean by that? What has changed? I think, I think, sorry, but I think that I think the system is so polarized and so, uh, and, the, and the parties are so ideologically homogenous now as opposed to the old days. There used to be middle of the road Republicans, yes. middle of the road Democrats. Those are gone. So if you're a Republican, you're much more concerned about a primary than you are about losing the middle ground. And that means the president controls that base for the moment and therefore the, the fate of these senators and congressmen. And, and the question is in a practical political sense, is this going to be considered a high crime, right. as is in the Constitution? And uh, you've talked to some of the Republican senators, and they're really sticking by him, or at least he's yes. got enough sticking by him. And so I think the big question is, are, are they going to broaden this investigation? Because right. Having done this for too many decades, there's always more mm -hmm. someplace. And whether people in the media or whether investigators are going to find it. Uh, but to just look through this one keyhole, small part of Trump world, uh, may not be enough to really understand what's hidden because things are. Right. And you raise this point that's, I think, really important here. We're only three weeks into this, mm. but the speed with which we are hearing more and more about what was happening behind the scenes, the text messages that were revealed this week, the testimonies that will be happening behind closed doors this coming week, does the speed of this change something here in terms of how we digest it? Well, they're trying to speed it up, mm. and uh, they've said this is all about Ukraine, but uh, the Trump presidency is about, if I were to count them, you know better as you cover this, 400 other things. And um, I, ju I just think you, wa you want a comprehensive look. Now, in the Internet age of impatience and speed, uh, everyone, you know, decide it now. Tell right. me exactly what's going on. And... This process is too important. You're exactly mm -hmm. right. Are, are we going to get into an election that will be kind of a referendum up and down on right. the impeachment investigation? The Democrats need to really be careful about yeah. how they let this play out. I, I mean, suppose uh, something happens we, and something will happen and it's unresolved and Clinton, uh, I'm sorry, Trump is still out there, yeah. you know, 
banging on everyone yeah. and the Democrats who are trying, I mean, we're, we're in for, I mean, let's hope it's not a bloody 2020. Well, do facts matter anymore, Peter? It is so interesting to listen to the president talk up there, and he will say things that are not true and just repeat them and repeat them as if somehow that will make them true, right? The whistleblower got my call all wrong. Well, actually, no, the whistleblower had a pretty accurate account of that call. Uh, you know, Hunter Biden took a billion and a half out of China. Well, that's just not the case. You know, I mean, that's to say that Hunter Biden didn't have business in China. He did. He had business in Ukraine. Those are worth scrutinizing. But the president keeps getting up there and saying things that are just demonstrably untrue. Fact checkers are working overtime these days to sort out the sort of stuff he throws against the wall to see if it'll stick versus the things that are genuine and real. Mm -hmm. And that's a real challenge here. I think both President Nixon and President Clinton were held to account when they said things that were not true and they, for, in effect, backed off when they were confronted with evidence that they were wrong. This president doesn't back off when he's confronted with evidence that he's wrong. Peter, uh, thank you so thank much you. for your perspective. We'll be right back with our political panel. It's now time for some analysis from our political panel. Susan Page is the Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today. Julie Hirschfield Davis is the congressional editor at the New York Times and co-author of a new book, Border Wall Wars, Inside Trump's Assault on Immigration. I said walls, wonder why. Ramesh Panuru is a senior editor at the National Review and a Bloomberg opinion columnist. And Jamel Bowie is a columnist for the New York Times and a CBS News political analyst. Good to have all of you here. Thank you. Ramesh, I, I want to start with you. You heard Senator Blunt do what Marco Rubio did the other day, which is to say the defense of the president will rest on don't believe your eyes and don't believe your ears. He didn't actually say what he said. Right. Or he didn't mean it. So don't, right. don't take him seriously. Don't take him literally. Um, I think that it reflects the difficulty Republicans are having in defending President Trump's conduct here. So we've had a, first an attempt to say the president didn't set foreign policy um, in a way that was calculated to serve his domestic political interests. And now we're beginning to hear an argument that it's okay that if he, if he did do that, that was totally within his prerogative. And it's sort of a cacophony of defenses because no one of them is really quite strong enough. Mm -hmm. And yet no one is challenging the conduct. There is not a, I have a problem with what was done. It was just, I'm going to stay with the party. Nobody is challenging it, with few exceptions. And not many you don't people, even need one hand. Not many, people are, <laughs> not many people are defending it either. Mostly what they want to do is deflect. They want to change the subject, or they just want to be silent and uh, not show up on TV at all. <laughs> this is true. Jamel, um, is this strategy uh, of going down the impeachment inquiry path potentially going to backfire for Democrats? Thus far, there's no evidence that it is. Thus far, voters seem to be supportive of the investigation by a slim majority or sort of like very large uh, plurality. And as far as supporting outright impeachment and removal, there seem to be some indication that voters are open to it if the investigation uh, reveals or, or shows or proves serious mis misconduct. So I think my take on it is that Democrats are probably in, in, the, in the safe zone as long as this appears not to be some sort of partisan attack, right? As long as it looks like two voters, uh, that Democrats are investigating something quite serious, which is trying to tamper with the election, trying to uh, corrupt the election, basically trying to cheat uh, into a second term. As long as that's how it appears to voters, I think they're probably fine. And I think the extent to which the Republican defense does sort of hinge on trying to make this look very partisan, I think is a sense, it, it, is a, it shows that mm -hmm. Republicans recognize that that's the case as well. Susan, what does this mean for the 2020 race? I mean, you have Joe Biden out there with a Washington Post op-ed, but he hasn't sat and really answered questions to clear the air on this. You know, is it going to hurt him? Yes, it's, go it's going to hurt him. It's hurting him already, fairly or not. You know, we should start any discussion of this by saying there's no evidence that Joe Biden did anything illegal or anything improper. Uh, that said, on this show, we saw a commercial 
paid for by the Trump campaign making the case against Biden. We had a USA Today Ipsos poll this week that showed that by two to one, by 42 to 21 percent, Americans say it would be legitimate. There are valid reasons to investigate Biden's behavior when it came to Ukraine. You know, the, the behavior was not illegal. It's not unusual for family members to try to cash in on mm -hmm. famous or powerful relatives. It is one, something that Americans do not like. It is unseemly. And that is a question that Joe Biden is going to have to answer moving forward. And Julie, you've seen some of the competitors to Joe Biden. You had Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren express some discomfort with this, that we wouldn't let our VP have their child on the board of a company. Right. I mean, they haven't directly criticized Joe Biden. And mm -hmm. as Susan said, no one's in his party certainly is suggesting that he's done anything wrong, but they are suggesting that this was an error in judgment on his part, that right. if, if it had been them, they wouldn't have allowed for that to happen. And I think they recognize, as the Biden campaign recognizes, that uh, they were facing headwinds even, even before any of this came out. Uh, you know, he, we saw his fundraising uh, lag a bit behind his, some of his leading competitors, and he was already facing headwinds in Iowa and, and, and New Hampshire. And so they see uh, a need to sort of distance themselves from this kind of behavior because, as you said, voters really don't like this. And that's a lot of the reason that Trump won in 2016 to begin with is he talked about the swamp and not liking the way that, you know, these things tend to play out in Washington. And this looks bad. It doesn't look great for him. What's striking, though, is that the president's own children are engaged in this kind of behavior. And right. What I find just fascinating about the fact that President Trump has made this his avenue mm -hmm. of attack is that it's very easily it doesn't take very much skill or, or, or right. anything to reverse it and say, well, your, your children are doing this pre precisely the same thing. And yet this doesn't seem to have really made a mark on the discussion about Trump's attack at all. No. Um, I, I want to take a quick break here and come back because there's more to talk about as to what happened on the trail. I want to talk about your new book uh, and much more. So we'll be back in a moment. We're back now with more from our political panel. Beyond impeachment, I want to touch on a few key things that happened this week. Susan, uh, the <laughs> one of the front runners in this race, Bernie Sanders, 78 years old, has a heart attack, and his campaign says nothing for three days. What does this mean for his candidacy? Well, I think it underscores questions about his age, uh, which he'll have to address by getting back on the campaign trail, participating in the next debate, looking, looking vigorous. It raises questions about his transparency. Uh, you know, we have an expectation that we would have gotten this news earlier and that we would have been able, news reporters, to interview his doctors. I remember something similar with the Hillary Clinton campaign That's right. with a lot of criticism over and, lack of disclosure. And we saw the damage that did to Hillary Clinton. They, the president, President Trump, raised questions about her health, raised unfounded questions about how healthy she was. It hurt her. Uh, so so uh, I think Bernie Sanders faces some similar challenges here now. He had a great fundraising quarter, right. more than $25 million, but he is not doing so well in the polls. And Elizabeth Warren is coming in like a steamroller with some of those progressive voters that are the base of Bernie Sanders' support. So with Sanders coming off of this, when you look at Biden facing the challenges he is facing, what does this mean for the field? <laughs> I mean, it, <laughs> a lot of things. Um, what one thing is that I think it does if Biden ends up declining as a result of all of this and if Sanders still can't expand beyond his supporters I think it does leave a wide open field for Elizabeth Warren to continue uh, attracting other voters and kind of positioning herself as the front runner in the race I think it also may open up space in that second tier of candidates Cory Booker Kamala Harris Kamala Harris in between the first and second to a tier um, Pete Buttigieg candidates who have a lot to sell on paper mm -hmm. who haven't quite caught fire, uh, who have been kind of crowded out by these top three, but if either of them decline in a serious way, can maybe capture some of those voters and become a compelling alternative. And for those members of Congress, senators who are looking at re-election issues in, in 2020, is that part of the calculus of not criticizing or taking on the president directly? Absolutely. I mean, I think that one of the interesting things we saw a few months ago during the vote over the border wall emergency was that pretty much all of the Republicans in tight races in 2020 decided to stick with the president, calculating that even if he's unpopular in their states, he's popular enough with Republicans that they can't take the risk of losing their support. So why Susan Collins, Ben Sass, and Mitt Romney? 
those are the only three senators who have come out with any kind of strong objections to well, what the president has done. I think for a couple reasons. S Senator Romney has was recently elected. He doesn't face the voters for a while. Um, the president has been less popular in Utah than Romney is himself, so he's strong there. Senator Collins in Maine, she's got a similar issue. She's earned some credit with Republican base voters for her defense of Justice Kavanaugh, and she understands that the state is not particularly pro-Trump. But you'll notice, as you said earlier, this is just a hand, less than a handful <laughs> of people, and Trump is trying to make an example of Romney mm -hmm. by attacking him on Twitter. Um, I'm not sure that's really going to do any damage to Romney, but it's not intended to so much as it's intended to scare other people away. Uh, Julie, I want to talk about the book that you have that came out this week. It had some extraordinary um, anecdotes and reporting in it that the president came out and uh, tried to shoot down. Moats and alligators shooting migrants in the leg. What is real? What happened behind closed doors that the president says he was not considering? Well, I mean, I think what's real is his uh, real obsession with this issue. Um, he has been working since before he took office to really target immigrants and immigration as an issue politically and substantively. Um, he does tend to sort of fly into a rage about these things and mention ideas that sound outlandish to our ears and to the ears actually of some of his advisors, and they have managed to talk him down from some of them. Um, we talk in the in the piece that was adapted from the book that came out in the Times last week about uh, his desire to shut down the border completely. He said, we're just going to do it at noon tomorrow. And of course that didn't happen, and neither did the trench happen, and there are no alligators or snakes, and nobody's being shot in the legs at the border. Um, but a lot of what you will see in the book is these behind the scenes conversations about uh, him sort of grasping at straws to figure out ways to get at this problem that he feels like he cannot have an influence over, even though it's what he ran on, even though it's what he cares the most about, and he thinks it's what his base cares the most about. And, and you write about Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law and advisor, saying essentially we've wasted two years on immigration. Yeah, in the middle of the, the government shutdown, which is, you know, that's shut down over the border wall. Um, you know, at, at some point he gets sort of deputized to find President Trump a way out of this. And he has kind of an Immigration 101 download from immigration advisors inside the government and is questioning them about what can work and what mm -hmm. can't work. And, and it sort of dawns on him in, in one of these meetings that, you know, and he says out loud, we've wasted the last two years that they've focused so much on the wall, focused so much on this physical structure yeah. that they haven't actually ended up getting their hands around the problem. Thanks to all of you for trying to make sense of a very busy week. We will be right back. That's it for us today. Thanks for watching and thank you to the Jones Day Law Firm for the facilities here on Capitol Hill. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.